today is about fruitfulness for a Christian professional. So we are discussing with the Christian professionals and we are saying how can a Christian professional be fruitful? And I think that, that's, a, that's a very, very important thing to address. So I'm grateful that uh, you have asked me to talk on, on, this, on this issue. Fruitfulness and contending for your faith, especially in your workplace, but generally speaking, everywhere. You know, when you talk about the word fruitful, you, I'm talking about that every year, every month, Every week, every end of the day, you'll be encouraged to do an evaluation. And when you do so, you are not being original. When God created the earth, every end of the day, he would stop and check how he has performed. And each of the end of the day, he said, it is good. It is good every day. He did not wait until the end of the week in order to see whether it is good. He evaluated on a daily basis, whether what he had done is good. And every professional needs to have that, um, um, that way of looking at things, that you don't wait until you get the big fruit. Quick wins should encourage you to go for the bigger wins, and you need to check that regularly. But how do you check as a professional whether you are being fruitful? The first question you must answer is, how is your life contributing to your employer's bottom line? If you're an entrepreneur, how was the day or the week or the month or the year when you have done your arithmetic? What is the net profit? What is the net contribution? Because the reason why you are in a business, the reason why you are in an organization is to help that organization to achieve its objectives. So you can't say you are fruitful when you are draining the resources of your employer without achieving the reason for which he actually employed you. And that's a very, very important thing because some Christians assume the reason they are employed is to evangelize people to get saved. But if you really check the way they are performing, it's pretty bad. Like you, maybe you are a, an, account, an accountant. You are supposed to not only do a good job at work, but you also finish your CPA. Here is a person who is a Christian, but so is so involved in evangelism that he can't do his CPAs. And when somebody else is promoted, they say, when a, when a neonair, <laughs> in English, they are saying for me, they are being unfair. The truth of the matter is, if you are going to be a fruitful Christian, it should be seen by the way, you are progressing professionally. Your time needs to be managed in such a way that you are progressing professionally and your progression can actually be measured. So whether you're an entrepreneur or you are actually employed somewhere, that is very, very important. And many Christians fail because they do not see, they do not bother to check on that. And every time non-Christians are progressing professionally, we start thinking, ah, it's because, it's because I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. Surely, it will be totally unfair. You left university at the same time. You, you are still CPA too. I have cleared my CPA 3. I am not saved, but you are saved. Why would the, would the employer be unfair and promote you before the one who is working hard? Especially if you are not just passing your CPAs, you are also doing a good job at work. If both of you are doing a good job, the one with the CPA is the one who will be promoted. So when we are talking about being fruitful in your workplace, it must start with, why am I being paid money? Some people earn money, others steal it. And when you actually go ahead and, and do not do a good job, you actually are stealing. Because that's not the reason. It's not my, I don't think I'll have enough time to deal with that. But I've written books which in, on this topic. The, the first book I have, um, I, have, uh, I, have, I have written on it is, I hope, I hope you, can, you can actually see it. I, I try to tell you, for you to be fruitful in that area, it will be important for you to operate within your calling. 
I call the book Discovering Your Life Purpose. When you discover your purpose, then even your job you do at work must be contributing to that purpose. And so the first evaluation being fruitful is, are you realizing your mission and vision? It's not just an organization that's supposed to have a vision and mission. Every individual, every family must have vision and mission. And maybe that's a topic we can share on another day. The other book I've written on, on that one is a book um, called, I hope you can, you can actually, I don't think you can actually see it. It's called The Christian Professional Leading in the Marketplace. Brother Kemeikan, is the book visible? Brother Kemei, can you hear me? This meeting is being recorded. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Um, so I was saying that... Um, the book, I've written a book called The Christian Professional in the Marketplace. is answering the same question. How can a Christian be fruitful in his work? And again, you can... Somebody muted me because I didn't mute myself. <laughs> Maybe it's, um, it's part of, the, part of the, the, the requirement for the host. So I hope you can see the book because in the few minutes I have, I may not cover everything. So the first thing is verify whether you are, you are, your employment or your business is helping you to fulfill your calling in life. Number two, my next book is A Christian Professional in the Marketplace. And it's answering the question, how can you be fruitful in the marketplace? I've written another book, I don't have it just now, called Work Ethics. In other words, for you to be fruitful, you will need to operate ethically in your workplace. And then finally, I have written a, a book called Integrity, the Litmus Test of Good Leadership. All those books are written to answer the question, how can you be fruitful in the marketplace as a Christian? Because that, be, that will be something that will be very, very important for you to, for you to deal with. Um, Having said that, and all that is dealing with the fruitfulness in the, on the first line, the second thing is, you need to ask yourself, how are you as a colleague in your place of work? Because has your life developed others? Have you been a, a workmate that people would, would be unhappy to lose? Because that's the work of a Christian. How will you ever win people to the Lord if you are the guy they say is difficult when the people here you are coming, you are joining their department. They say, hey, not that one, not that one. If, uh, um, uh, if any departmental head hears you are coming, that, but that's a difficult man around him in my department. If you truly are a Christian, to be fruitful means to be, make impact on your colleagues. And I think that will be a very, very important thing. So developing others so that by the time you are retired like me, you look back to the lives you impacted in your working life because they became better. You help somebody to move from one level to another level, professionally and spiritually. You invested in them. So when we're asking, are you fruitful in your workplace? We're also asking, not just are you making money. We are saying, are people growing? professionally, spiritually, are they growing because you are working in that place? And finally, the third uh, question you must ask, how is your being there honoring God? Well, that will be very, very important. You can be in that place, but nobody is getting to know Jesus. Nobody is getting to love Jesus. Nobody is growing 
in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, when you become a professional, you are parish. Unlike the, the pastor, your parish is your workplace. So when you're employed, like I was in Shell for almost that year, I joined Shell in 1979 and retired in 08, about that year. That is my parish. And God will hold me accountable. Ezekiel is saying, he has made me you a watchman. <laughs> Even there any one of the people who is working that place goes to hell. His blood will be required out of your hand. So when we are talking about fruitfulness, we are saying the people that are not saved in your workplace, they have rejected Christ. Therefore, like Ezekiel is told, their blood will not be required of the, out of your hand. Because you told them, you shared the gospel with them. It's their responsibility to look for a way of sharing the gospel. Obviously, we are not saying that you should do it during office hours. But office hours is what will give you the contact so that you book that person during tea break or during lunch hour or during the weekend. You say, can I buy you a cup of tea on, the, on Saturday? Then, because you are workmate, they will come for the tea. And it's your responsibility to check this year how many people have I shared the gospel with. That, that is critical. Not how many people have gotten saved. Because we do not, God never asks you to save anyone. All he asks you is to share the gospel with them. So as you are asking this question, have I honored God? You'll be asking, how many people have I clearly shared the gospel with? And that will be something that's very important. Now let me give a bit of testimony. And I'm referring to, to 1977, working for a development bank. And my first question is, how can I be an ambassador in this bank, in banking industry? That's what I felt as I, started, as I started working after university. But you know, it never took me time. Within the first month, I think it was the first month, I was working in accounts. I did a Bachelor of Commerce degree. My first degree is Bachelor of Commerce. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm there, and then... Um, and, and then uh, it's a requirement in the department that when you arrive in the morning, you write down your name at the time you have arrived. It's an arrival register. And so as a Christian, I know that that's what you obey. So I was writing, and everything was moving on okay. My, they, they were calling me the new, the young man who had joined the, the department. One day, I came late. And what happened is in the process, I wrote down, John Nganga, age 15. And then I went, I told myself I should try very hard not to come late again. But throughout the day, I started seeing people are looking at me in a strange way. I looked at myself, is it the way I'm dressed? What is the problem? And I could see everybody sneering at me. It was towards lunch hour, one of the ladies came and said, young man, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. Why did you report us to the boss? I said, I have not been to the boss. I have not reported you. Said, you say you don't understand what you did. What did I do? Said, you made all of us report, be, be, be reported to the boss that we came late. Said, I have not done that. Said, are you a fool? Can't you see what you did? The, by writing down 8.15, it meant everybody who came after me could not say they did not come. You can only write 8.15 or 8.16. Kumbe, the, the normal practice in that place, everybody came at 8. Even if you arrived at 9, you wrote 8 o'clock. So, because you write, when you can't write earlier than the person ahead of you. By writing 8.15, all the people that came after me were reported late like me. And they said, you had messed my record. You know, I quickly had to realize I'm in trouble. So I was told the person, you know, I'm a Christian. I can't tell a lie. Even next time I come, I take that day. Eh? I'll write, I've come, I take that day. Eh? Please pray I never come late again. But there's nothing I, can, I cannot write when I did not come. And you could see I caused trouble. They did not know there are people that foolish, <laughs> you know, that you are, you are Christianity, you are bringing it at work. So even without my having to go out of my way to witness, the very way I'm living my life was creating a problem. 
And that's when I realized I better be clear with them. And so that is 77, 78. I finally went to the personnel manager. Those days, HR managers were called personnel manager. And asked for, I asked for, for, for permission to start a prayer meeting. And I started a prayer meeting where many of the people who came were Mama Chai, the tea lady, that kind of level of workers. Although I myself was an executive, that, that's the kind of people who came. One of the young men who came there turned out to be the son of Dedan Kemadi. And he gave his life to the Lord. Many years later, we were, we went, we were ministering, ministering with him. That's what I'm talking about as an example. That if you got your place of work, your life, not just your verbal testimony, your life must start making a difference in that, in that place. If people started arriving on time because of, my, because of what I did, that's to the benefit of the company. Of course, I was very uncomfortable, but that's really what your contribution is. Create standards that others, even if they are your bosses, will have no alternative than to follow because you are doing the right thing, which they themselves should also be doing. You know, when you talk about being a witness and fruitful in your place of work, you are saying you are an ambassador for the king and you know your king is Jesus Christ. So you are in that place as a representative of Jesus. But I would like to encourage you to understand you cannot be a person who is working for your home country by being irresponsible in your country of where you are sent. I still remember uh, I used to work, when I was working for Shell, I used to work in the region office covering about 10 countries from Madagascar, this region all the way to Djibouti. In one of those countries, our Kenyan ambassador was a Christian. So I still remember going to him and I was asking about the place. And he told me, you know, to be an ambassador is a very tough thing. I know I'm being covered by the security people of this country. So I can't just go anywhere. So even if you're an ambassador, you have to understand there are certain expectations. Because whatever you do is assume that's what your country does. Please just listen to Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's working for the Lord, not for human masters. So that although you have a boss, and your boss may be unreasonable, he may even be a crook. The word of God is telling you, please understand, you are an ambassador from heaven, working in that place. Your immediate boss is not your final authority. Look at verse 24. Since you know that you, are, you will receive an inheritance, from the Lord as your reward. Your real employer is not the one who pays, your, who pays your salary. Your real employer is in heaven. Just in case you don't understand that, Paul becomes even clearer. He says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. The truth is, you are serving a master. You are reporting to a master on earth. But in reality, Paul is saying, you are serving the Lord Christ. And that's one of the things you will need to understand as a professional, we are still answering the question, how can you be fruitful? We began by defining what it means to be a fruitful professional, Christian professional. We are now asking, how can you be fruitful? And we are saying, by stopping to see your immediate boss as the ultimate boss, but seeing Christ as the final authority. So whatever you do, it must be done in such a way that you are doing what your job description tells you to do, but you are doing it in such a way that it honors God who is your real boss in heaven. You know, for, for you to really be fruitful, it will mean to be, your, your work will need to be motivated by praising the Lord. And I have realized my time, I don't have enough time to go on with these testimonies. And because they are in my books, I will, lead, I will leave you to, to read the book and see the testimonies that, um, that I'm, I'm giving. Um, but one of the things that will be important is to, to understand that if you, are, if you truly are going to be fruitful, you will need to be fair and just. Because you are keeping heavenly standards, therefore you, can have, you cannot have partiality. And I still remember, by now I, was, I had been promoted into management. And um, there's a contractor who is an assistant minister in the Kenya government. 
but he wants to be treated as a minister and he's a contractor. And I explained to him, every contractor has a contract and your contracts are the same. I cannot treat you any different from other. When I say this is required of contractors, if you don't keep it, I'll cancel your contract. And he just laughs. <laughs> How? Actually, I finally canceled the contract. By canceling the contract, he was so offended. I, we, Shell actually got a letter from the Minister of Energy to show cause. And my job was at stake. My Muzungu, my white man CEO, was saying, is there anything we can do? And I said, no, we cannot treat him differently. Obviously, I knew my job is at stake. I could easily be fired. But I cannot be a Christian and be involved in partiality, where some, uh, some contractors who are not politicians are treated one way. These are the ones, because we fear them, they are treated different. And so I, was, I, I had put my job at stake. It is that that you will make people know that you are not playing around with your Christianity, that you, you are willing to take a risk of being fired. But sometimes it's not just being fired, it's being killed, because they'll shoot you dead. But you know your protection is not your employer. Your protection is Christ. So if you do something Christ has told you to do, he is the one to protect you against the bullet of the crooks that are unhappy with the, with the way you are operating. I'm still alive. That tells you God protected me. But I actually did get a lot of threats by keeping to biblical standards. But in the process, many people had God's word. The other day, one of my former CEOs was telling me how they had bumped each other with a, a Somali Muslim contractor. And he was telling him, of course, we are all retired. And he was telling him, hey, do you meet John Nganga? I said, why? Do you know I have worked? I'm with a contractor in several oil companies. I have never met somebody like that. He kept to his word. He kept his promise. You know very well that if he is your manager, he will do what he says he will do. And he does not favor one against another. Now, of course, even it was during the time I was still working, you can say they are trying to they are trying to get a good word for me. Now that I don't gain out of his testimony. So the CEO, the next time I bummed the CEO in a rugby club, he said, hey, John, you're not here. Imagine what I was told. It means even if that Muslim has not yet gotten saved, he now knows Christianity is real. And there are people who live by that testimony. That's what we are talking about when you're talking about being fruitful. And we could go on. I just want, I've already taken 22 minutes, and I, I want to, to finish not too long from here. But I want to answer the question, why are some Christians not fruitful in their workplace? Why is the bottom line? <laughs> Which was the third, if you remember, the third question was, how is your life bringing people to Christ or discipling those who are Christians? Although you are employed as an accountant, you are employed as an engineer, you are employed as HR, it doesn't matter what your job is. You are, the job you are paid for may be HR. The job heavens, heaven pays for is that you are representing Christ. You are winning people to the Lord. Why are people, some people not fruitful? If you read my book, The Christian Professional, I've suggested seven lies which Christian professionals live by, and because of that, they end up not being, 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 uh, not, not, not being fruitful. The first lie is there is a, such a thing as secular work and spiritual work. You know, so that you'll find somebody in an evangelistic team, when there is a mission, those people are dynamism. People are getting saved in their place of work. Nobody even knows they are saved. After all, this is, uh, this is, this is work. My friend, if you become a Christian, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Whatever it includes, when you are preaching, whatever it includes, when you are a father, whatever it includes, when you are a husband, whatever it includes, everything. After all, the word whatever does not mean anything else other than whatever. It therefore means that to a Christian, there is no such a thing as secular work. 
all work is spiritual because everything you do and we read the, we read the Colossians 3 to 3:23 with you a little earlier you are doing it for God so it's a spiritual thing so when you accept the lie of the double life that at one time I'm a Christian I'm doing Christian work no no the other time I'm now working doing secular work there's no such a thing when you are an accountant how you add and subtract figures God is watching you and he wants you to do it to honor him for the benefit of your employers, but to honor him. So it's a spiritual thing. And many people, because of that dichotomy, secular versus spiritual, will be very effective in church. They're even elders. They are deacons. But in their place of work, they have no fruitfulness. And they don't even feel guilty. After all, I'm doing so much for the Lord. Because they are, and what they are doing is what they are doing in church. And church, you are there only for two, three hours. In your place of work, you are there for not less than 45 hours. Surely, how will you give account for your spiritual impact? Because you see, church will come to bring in the sheaves. The work is not done during a Sunday. The work is done in the six days of the week. We serve the Lord the six days of the week. Then on Sunday, we bring the results of our work. Just listen to Romans chapter 1. Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What is God's will? If it is God's will, it must be good. Good for you, and good for the people you are dealing with. It cannot be God's will when your job is harming others, like selling drugs. Whatever work you do must be adding value to human beings. Number two, it must be pleasing to the Lord. If it's not pleasing to the Lord, it's not a job you should be doing. That's why, for example, if you're working for breweries, you have a real problem saying that working for breweries is a good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because... If you are getting people drunk, how could that be pleasing the Lord? Your job must be a job that honors God. That's why I'm removing the word secular and spiritual. Any work you do, you must say it is good. It is pleasing to the Lord. Then it will be perfect will. So there isn't anything secular. And when you understand that your place of work is your place of ministry, it is your parish, then the way you live your life in the office will matter. Because it's how you do your accounting, uh, your accounting that will attract people to the kingdom. So you must work as a good accountant. Then, because of that, they ask you, why are you like this? In giving answer to that question, you tell them about your savior. Second lie. Some professionals believe, Christian professionals believe, that only church work needs God's calling. For example, to be a pastor, or even a missionary, God must have called you. But to be an engineer, you don't require God's call. <laughs> what a lie. Haven't we just demonstrated in the first, in the, with, the, with the first issue that everything you do, and that's what I've written in my book, Discovering Your Life's Purpose, everything you do must be within your calling. God's direction to Moses in Exodus 28 verse 3 illustrates the point I'm trying to make. It says, Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given a wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. Are you a skilled worker? Are you an accountant? Are you a HR professional? Are you whatever other profession? Are you a doctor? Are you a nurse? That's a skilled work. He is saying, tell skilled workers that number one, they are only skilled because I have given them wisdom. You are a professional, you are professional understanding and knowledge. It's actually a gift from God. And that gift is to benefit God's people, is to benefit God's creation. Just listen to Exodus 31, emphasizing the same point. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezaliel, son of Uri, 
the son of Hal, of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with the Spirit of God. Hey, this guy is filled with the Spirit of God. To do what? He is filled with wisdom. To do what? He is filled with understanding by the Holy Spirit. To do what? He is filled with the knowledge in all kinds of skills. To do what? To make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. To cut and set stones. To work in wood. And to engage in all kinds of crafts. The first time I read, I said, wait a minute. How can you waste the Holy Spirit? He is full of the Holy Spirit not to preach. He is full of the Holy Spirit not to, not, not to, not, not to do miracles. He is full of the Holy Spirit to do artwork, to do engineering, to do HR. Did I know that to do a normal, normal job of my profession, I require to pray for God's anointing? That's what Exodus is teaching us. That your professional life needs an anointing. Anointing is not just for a prophet. Anointing is not just for pastors. Engineers require anointing. They require calling. The same way pastors say, the Lord called me to be a pastor. Engineers must say, the Lord called me to be an engineer. The same way the missionaries say, God called me to be a missionary. In the same way the headmaster of a school must say, God called me to be a headmaster. Don't become a principal or a headmaster when you don't sense God is calling you to do it. Everything you do must be done because of God's calling. But when you start thinking that you, you are a, only pastors are called, then it means the pastors must be careful. In fact, sometimes when you hear pastors done something, higher, how can he do that and he's a pastor? In other words, you, that's an engineer, it's understandable when you feel. No! Whether you're a pastor or an engineer, both of you are operating within their calling. It's only one is called to be in church, the other one is asked to work out of the church, but you're all working for the Lord. So this idea of thinking that only the pastors are called is what has made people to fail to serve the Lord in their workplace. Because they wait until Sunday to work for the Lord. They wait until Saturday to work for the Lord. So the other five, six days, they are not working for the Lord. So they do whatever they want. It's in fact, some, sometimes when you, your secretary hears you are, that you are an elder somewhere, he says, what? My boss is an elder. What kind of an elder could he be? Because in your place of work, you operate like you have never heard of Christ. Because you think that you are not called. You can do whatever you want there. You can see you will not be fruitful the way we discussed at the beginning, until you understand that God has called you to that to the three areas I talked about in the introduction. Line number three. Some Christian professionals believe that only pastoring is full-time ministry. You know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm full-time. Now, if you are, the other one says, oh, no, I'm part-time. Now, if you are part-time in serving the Lord, there are only two lords in the world, the devil and the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ part-time, does it just mean the other time you are serving the devil? This is an unbiblical, unbiblical statement. You can, some people serve the Lord full-time in church. Some people serve the, the, the Lord full-time in industry. But both of them are serving the Lord full-time. That's what you need to understand. And if, you, if I don't communicate fully, because I can see my time is getting finished, I think I would really recommend you look at any one of the books, um, both the Christian Professional and, work, and the book on work ethics. I, I emphasize this very, very much. So the lie, if you have this lie, thinking that you are not working part-time, you are working part-time for the Lord, then you will certainly not be very useful during the five days of the week. Again, I repeat the same verses I've been quoting. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Why? Working, you are working for the Lord, not for human masters. Same, the same thing repeated in Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do, that word whatever is repeated. Whether in word or even in deed, the way you speak and the way you work, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving that to God the Father through him. Now, how could you do something in 
in Jesus' name. And don't and, and you say that you are not full time. You are not allowed to earn a salary from a job where you cannot say, I'm doing this for the Lord. So if you are, for example, in drug trafficking, can you say, I have now, I have now destroyed people's children in the name of the Lord? Remember, you're not supposed to do anything which you cannot do in the name of the Lord. So you cannot be in a career where you know you cannot say, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. But you know the dichotomy I'm trying to deal with is the one that allows somebody to earn money. They do all kinds of trash. Then they tithe out of the tithe. Some even steal. After stealing, they now tithe. Some of them don't even tithe. They tithe. They give 20%. No. The word of God is saying, whatever you do, only do what you can say you are doing in the name of the Lord. Now, when you start understanding your day-to-day -day work, God is concerned about it. You will see you will start having impact and fruitfulness in your place of work. Number four, some Christian professionals believe that spirituality is private. Only secular issues are public. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that. You know, this is, this is, this is very private. This is very private. You know, what you believe is a private heart matter, not biblically. You know, um, how I, normally when I'm leading people to the Lord, I quote for them uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 10. How do you come to the Lord? I agree part of it in the heart. Romans 10, 10 says, you believe in the heart, so that's private. But you are not yet saved. To be saved, there must be something that happens in the heart and something else happens in the mouth. So you cannot have Christianity that is private. Christianity is public. So when you lie to yourself that your, your Christian life is a private matter, you are not obeying the scriptures. Like I told you, I used to do a job where I was covering 10 countries in Africa. And I still remember one time there was, um, there was a World Cup. And every country I went to, before we could discuss the business of the meeting, people are saying, hey, did you, did you watch that game? I'm not quite interested in football. I find 22 people chasing one ball not very exciting. So I don't watch. But now, since I'm going to be leading the meeting, I needed to do, so what I'll do, I will not afford 90 minutes watching one game. And since I'm in a hotel, I would wait until it has ended and I watch a summary so I can tell who scored from where. So that I am talking a language. It's called breaking the ice. Before you go into the business of the meeting, you break the ice. Now, but then I ask myself, what has football to do with selling petroleum products, which was our business? Nothing. Just breaking the ice. So I discovered I cannot break ice only with oil. Why not with? Hey, by the way, where did you go to church yesterday? I said, John, I don't go to church at all. Why would you not go to church? We are just breaking the ice. Ah, you know me, I don't discuss spiritual things. I don't. Now, you know, even if we don't go beyond five minutes, I've already planted a seed in those other managers that are in the meeting with me. So when you, when you accept the devil's lie that your Christianity is a private matter, then you are discussing in the same business meeting, management meeting, People are talking about their ex-sex exploits. You know, the girl they were following, what happened. What? That is rottenness. Why can't you bring something spiritual? And you are not suggesting preaching. It's called breaking the ice. So it's not taking more than five minutes. But there's something you can say that will tilt people's mind towards spirituality. But not possible when most successful professionals, you can't even tell whether they are saved or not. Because that's a private matter. Don't you listen to Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 5? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trumped at the foot. Verse 14 now changes and says, You, the Christian, is the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, you Christian, you professional, let your light shine before others 
Don't be a private Christian. And then Jesus goes on, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How are they going to glorify the Father when you have kept it private? They don't even know why you, you behave the way you do. The fifth lie. Some Christian professionals believe that uh, you cannot be a minister of the gospel um, now that you do not have a title or pastor or pastor or reverend or apostle or bishop. My friend, I want you to understand that for a Christian professional, titles are a hindrance. In fact, I was introduced the other day talking to some people, I think it's Bishop Callisto, the, 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 um, the head of Sitam, who was telling, who was telling the, the pastors I was, I was speaking to, telling them that I believe John would not have been effective if he had become a pastor. And he referred to the fact that those days when I used to cover several countries, he was also working for IFES, International Fellowship of Christian Students, in many countries. So we used to coordinate when what he is doing and when I'm going for my job. And he says, by John being a professional, he was able to penetrate many places. My friend, your title as a pastor will not be a help. Many, many places where God has used me. People don't invite me to preach. They invite me to give a talk. On oh, when they hear a manager, I'm a manager in Shell. Oh, a manager, so and so, the regional manager of so and so, supply manager, what not, is coming to talk to us. They are very happy. As you remember, talking in an organization that was owned by a Christian and a, and a Muslim. And they were having a Christmas party. So I gave my talk. Not preaching, just a talk. When I sat down, the Muslim one said, hey, that was a wonderful talk. Hey, but uh, I didn't know. I, I, I don't know. One could talk, to turn it into a spiritual thing. But you see, I would never have been allowed in that place if I was a pastor or a reverend. Titles do not help you in ministry; they hinder you. Obviously, if you're a pastor, it's not that you are choosing to have a title. That's what your congregation calls you. But those of us who are not who are not pastors, let's not try to be anything. You know, I keep telling everywhere, and some of you who know me, everywhere I go, I am Brother Nganga. Why Brother Nganga? So that everyone can understand you do not require a title to be fruitful professionally. Many people come to know the Lord if they don't know. Like, I'm in an aircraft. I normally, uh, when I'm going, flying, I normally I'm ask, which seat do you want? Any. And then I pray that God Make the person who sits next to me in the, in the aircraft be somebody in spiritual need. And so when I, I sit next to somebody, I believe God has put him there for me to minister to them. Imagine I came in a collar. As soon as they see me, they know I'm a preacher. They will be very careful not to talk to me. But when I'm from, from Shell or around these days, I'm a consultant. When I say I'm a consultant, I'm a management consultant. Ah, what do you do? We start talking about management consultancy. By the time I turn the discussion to his spiritual condition, he is open. You need to understand this belief that you, you are not a minister unless you have a title is not a biblical one. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 13. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. What was the profession of our brother? What was his profession? My friend, you need to understand his profession was being a king, being a leader. But what are we hearing? He served God's purpose for his generation without being a pastor. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, So Christ himself gave some to be apostles. Yes, they have a title. Prophets, that's another title. Evangelists, another title. Pastors and teachers, another title. What is the work of those with titles? Now listen, verse 12. It tells you why they are, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm very clear, you need to have a few people as pastors, but the main congregation, 99% of the congregation, are not to have titles. Because the work of the pastors, verse 12 says, is to equip his people, the congregation, for the works of service. King James calls it the work of ministry. So the body of Christ may be built up. Are you hearing it? The work of pastors is to equip 
the Christians for the work of ministry. So who are the ministers of the gospel? Not the pastors. Pastors are not expected to be doing ministry. The work of the pastor is to equip us. Just like the superintendent of police in police college, Kiganjo. He doesn't stop vehicles on the road. He trains the traffic officers, but he himself does not stop in the road, road to stop vehicles. His work is to equip the traffic officers, not to do the work of traffic himself. The same way the pastor is not for doing ministry. Ministry is not the work of pastors. Ministry is the work of the congregation. And that's why you as a Christian professional must understand that although you are not a pastor, you are expected to be doing ministry. I have to be finishing. The sixth lie says, your mission is fully fulfilled by your financial giving. Have you heard that? You know, I don't do, I don't witness, but I tithe. Look at Acts 1.8. It says, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Who is being addressed? Not the apostles. Just look a little below in verse 15. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Who is being addressed? In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. The apostles only 12. The operation was 120. So, more than 100 people are the ones to wait for the Holy Spirit. And they are being told, all of them, all the more than 100 people are being told, each one of them will receive the Holy Spirit. When they receive the Spirit, they will become witnesses. So every Christian, not the apostles, but every Christian is an apostle. So you cannot fulfill this calling by giving money. Those with the gift of giving are not the only ones who, who participate in offerings. Everybody gives. But you know, some people say, you know, I'm, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I agree. You don't have the gift of evangelism. But witnessing, all of us witness. The way you tell the ones with the gift is that when you go for a mission, the people with the gift of evangelism will bring 10 people to the Lord. But those of us who don't have the gift of evangelism will bring one. Can you see, by everybody doing what God has called them to do, we will not just bring 10. There will be the additional one from others. And I think that will be something important. The final one is a lie. The lie is you, you are good Christian acts. We evangelize without you having to say words. And people, you hear people say that. I, I don't payuk about being a Christian. They will see through my works. A lie. <laughs> if somebody watches you being a good accountant, all they can say is, hey, people who want sinning issue. If you get an accountant from us in Gishu, they are good accountants. Because he doesn't know anything else about you. He doesn't know you are a Christian. People cannot honor God because of your good works. Unless they know your good work is associated with Christ. So you must verbalize your testimony. Then your work will help to amplify. Ever heard of somebody saying, actions speak louder than words? Why do they do that? Because the works amplify the words. In other words, if you say you are a Christian, but you are not, your works are not helping, then obviously people will not hear you. Your testimony, you must, it must be both what you do and what you say. What is Romans chapter 10 saying? Verse 14. How can they call on the, one, on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are saying, as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes by hearing. Do you want faith in your acme? Do you want to be fruitful in your place of work? You must verbalize the gospel. But in addition to that, you must work such that people can see what you are saying in the way you live your life. Faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Sorry, we have run out of time. I want, I want us to have enough time for questions. But I hope, as we have gone through the various seven items, you have identified the one the devil could be using in order to... Um... Can you hear me? Yes, we do. 
You are hearing me. Okay, I want to hand over the meeting back to Brother Kemei.